Hello there, watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. Time to see what's making the headlines then with, tonight, the Daily Mirror's associate editor, Kevin Maguire, and the former Conservative special advisor, Anita Botang. Welcome and great to see both of you. So, to the front pages then, let us start with the Metro reacting to the government's intention to introduce new powers, forcing convicted criminals to attend their sentencing. The Metro has this headline, We'll see you in court, cowards. The decision welcomed to by the Daily Mail with this headline, at last, killers will have to face justice. It's also the lead story for the Daily Express. The Guardian, meanwhile, has news that witnesses will be forced to give evidence to the inquiry into the handling of the Lucy Letby killings by health officials. The Times reports that police officers are to be automatically sacked if found guilty of gross misconduct or a criminal offence under new powers to be introduced. With his autumn statement due soon, the I says the Chancellor has ruled out any tax cuts this year, which it says will anger many Tory MPs. Well, a reminder by scanning the QR code that you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers for yourself while listening to our guests. So let's head straight to them, to Kevin Maguire and Anita Botang. And Anita, why don't you start off then uh, the different elements of the Lucy Letby story, uh, the Daily Mail picking up on this idea that uh, killers will have to be dragged into the dock to hear their sentencing. Yes, and, and we do know that there are some ways in which that can already happen, but basically this is a new piece of legislation the government is bringing in that's been under conversation for um, a while now, and it's going to basically give judges new powers to sort of explicitly order... Um, these, these offenders to be present in the courtroom when sentencing is happening. It makes it clearer in law that reasonable force can be used in order to make that a reality, to sort of empower prison officers to be able to get these um, offenders into court to sort of hear and be sentenced and hear the judge's verdict. Yes, and the Prison Officers Association making clear that those powers do exist now, but often not directed strongly enough by the judge. And their feeling is that this could be extremely disruptive, not yeah. least to the victim's families who are sitting there watching, you know, what could end up being a circus. Yeah, no, the victim's families hope they, they see the convicted, uh, crushed, uh, very contrite... Uh, what if they're going to be laughing, uh, smirking, sneering, uh, making hand signals, uh, disrupting it? So, look, my, my own paper, The Daily Mirror, has been campaigning on this for months for it to, to happen because of the public backlash. It'll be hugely, hugely popular, but the powers are there now. And I think the reason they're rarely used is, is judges are using their discretion in courtrooms. Of course judges think they uh, should. The, the guilty should be there to hear the impact from family of their, their crimes uh, and for their sentencing. But, of course, judges realise there are going to be problems here. And listen, listening to the national chair of the Prison Officers Association uh, uh, earlier, watching him on mm. Sky News, I thought, I thought he was just, just very good because, of course, he backs the powers, but he says maybe, maybe one way around it and stop, uh, stopping uh, the families having to listen to abuse from the, uh, fr from the, uh, the guilty is to pipe in the statements into... <laughs> a cell, uh, and you can turn off the sound so you don't hear them screaming abuse back at you. But, uh, no, I mean, look, I'm with, I'm with the government on this. Labour have been pushing it, the Daily Mirror has been pushing it, but victims' groups have been pushing it, families have been pushing it, mm. but there are problems, undoubtedly. Mm. And, actually, one of the cases that the Daily Mail has picked up on, uh, this man, bottom... Uh, left, uh, Thomas Cashman, one of those who did not appear, and, and the victim in this case was nine-year-old yeah. Olivia Pratkobel. You know, her mother's been campaigning hard on this, yeah. and it's, you know, all, all very well piping it down to the cells, yeah. but it's like the families need to see the faces of the person who did this to their relatives. Yes, it? yes yeah. I think that's true, but I think that they, it, it's sort of what do, you, what do you want from that? You want them to yeah. sort of feel the impact of what they've actually done, not yeah. be able to turn away, but, but that's I think exactly it, there it? is a world in which those, those, those offenders are brought kicking and screaming, you know, saying all sorts of things happen. Once a verdict is read, they could laugh, they could do all sorts of things that could then re-traumatise. So I think, I mean, to be clear, the, the powers are coming in and absolutely it's really important that there's now more of a conversation, more of a consideration that judges will mm. be taking about this specific issue of sentencing and presence there. But they still have discretion. So judges are still going to be able to say, well, in this instance, 
what my sense is that the, the families will be, I don't know, re-traumatised if this happens or there are concerns yeah. about, I don't know, safety or all the other things that come into play in a courtroom. So I think that's quite an important element of this reform. I, I'm nothing against dragging the convicted into the dock and handcuffing them, but how far do you want to go after that? Do you want to be gagging them? I mean, how, how would that look? Now, Olivia Pratt uh, Corbel, uh, who was the nine-year-old shot in her home in, in Liverpool, her mother said, well, if you know, they scream, so be it. Not everybody will take uh, the view. And I, I just I look at Lucy Ledby's victims, you know, the, the parents of those, those babies. I think it, it could have added to their trauma if Lucy Ledby kicked off in some way in the, in the dock. I'm not saying she would but she wouldn't go. And I, could, I understood why they wanted her there. You, know, you, you would. Well, to hear their it. victim statements. Absol they're absolutely. Now, now called personal statements absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Mm. But uh, I think the judges will still have to have some discretion because mm -hmm. the threat of uh, an extra two years, if, one, you refuse to go into the, into the dock, or, two, um, you know, shout and commit co contempt of court, won't have much impact if they've got a whole life sentence or no. 30 or 40 years. Now, maybe... In cases where the sentences are much smaller, the prospect of another two years may have an impact. But it's really these very high-profile, terrible cases that have caught the public imagination. And I'm not, I'm not sure there is that there is actually an easy answer. To this, unfortunately. Yeah, and when the the head of the POA, the Prison Officers Association, you know, already saying the very nature of their crimes means they don't care. Yeah, you know, that's yeah. part of the problem. And yeah. and also quoting mm -hmm. the case of Joanna Denhe, one of those other women of which there are now four who've been given a whole life tariff, who you know laughed and smirked in her own yeah, she, she sentencing. Yeah, she murdered three men in East Anglia, I think, from from uh, from memory. An but, another yeah. awful case. Yeah. Uh, the other uh, change today in the Lucy Letby case is. Presumably, we expected it that there's now going to go. It's going to be a public inquiry, which has now been upgraded to a statutory inquiry, uh, which means that compulsion is now involved for witnesses and so on. Yes, um, and I think this is important. So the government, when it first announced um, the inquiry, they sort of said, "We'll c consult with the families. We'll do what the families really want." And it, it was clear, it seems, from from consultation and conversation with them, they really wanted this to be on a statutory footing. Um, and that means that the most important element of what changes then is that witnesses can be compelled to give evidence. And, and because this is supposed to paint a picture not just of the specific, you know, moments at which perhaps Letby could have been captured or understood, but also the infrastructure and decision-making that sort of created a culture in which it was sort of an assumption of, oh, I'm sure this is all absolutely fine and just a misunderstanding, or however, um, you know, those witnesses may characterise it. I think that's quite important for understanding the NHS culture around accountability, which I think is going to be important for ensuring, really, that more NHS managers across the country are very aware of this possible, very slight, but possible scenario that could arise and are therefore more on the lookout for yeah. presumption of action rather than inaction. Yeah, the, the Health Secretary, Stephen Barclay, got it wrong at the beginning. There were quite a lot of voices saying that you're going to have to make this uh, statutory because of this power to compel people to appear and also call those documents. I don't think he was in any way involved in a cover-up or he didn't want the investigation to be thorough. He thought, look, we can do it more quickly this way. But I think, I think it was just wrong with the... Certainly with the families. But also, it's, it's not just those who lost their, lost their babies. It's all of us, because we all have a vested interest in getting to the bottom of what went wrong how it can be fixed and preventing it happening again. And I think... Make, well, it doesn't have to be this scenario. It could be any scenario. Oh, where, yeah. Where things aren't yeah. looking no. quite right on any ward or any no. unit, quite it, frankly. Oh, yeah, whether you're, whether you're near the cradle or, you know, the coffin, you know, whether you're very young or very old, somewhere in the, in the middle. No, we all, we all have a vested interest in the NHS working and, uh, and healing people and fixing them, not having rogue members of uh, staff going around killing people. Mm. And, and the former, um, well, now Chancellor, former Health Secretary Jeremy Hunt was quite interesting on this around, like, mistakes that get made, which obviously happens in all walks of life. And fortunately, if I make a mistake mm. right now, your readers will, yeah. uh, your audience will forgive me. But, you know, in those situations, like, really dire situations can happen. And how do you create more of a culture of accountability whilst not making doctors and nurses feel as though, you know, they're in, under this ridiculous amount of duress and they can't yeah. do a single thing wrong? And that's that's quite an important and difficult balance to strike and yeah. I think that hopefully this inquiry will help and really actually just help managers as well to figure out it's, how it's, to get that balance it's, right. it's, 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 like, it's life and death in the NHS. Yeah. 
And with any, with, with justice, and there's a, a, a large element of justice in this, it's, it's got to be seen to be done properly. Mm. And that's, well, uh, Jeremy Hunt was fully bought into Matthew Syed's black box thinking, which is if you investigate uh, an airline crash, why don't you do it in the NHS, which kind mm. of makes sense in all organisations, doesn't it? To the Times now, you use the word rogue. Um, Kevin, rogue police uh, to be sacked on the spot under new powers. Tell us about this. Yeah, it seems to be the day when the government's trying to catch up and, and do all those things it should have done some time ago. The opposition were calling for them, and they haven't. And, th and this one is to, is to make it easier, essentially, for police chiefs to sack officers who are guilty of crimes or uh, um, gross misconduct. And Mark Rowley, the Commissioner of Metropolitan Police, has been lobbying for this for some time. Chris Filt, the police minister, is finally going to announce it and make it easier. Now, we don't know the details, and that's where the devil always is. And how will it operate? Now, police officers, if you uh, commit gross misconduct or an offence, you can be s sacked on the spot, as the Times uh, put it in a headline. You'd still have a right of appeal, just like anybody else would in, uh, in, in law. You know, you've, got to have, you know, you've got to have whatever the charges are examined and they've got to be held against you. Mm and proved against you if you're going to be fired. So, so this is after the high-profile cases of David oh. Carrick and Wayne Cousins, yeah. and elements of the, the Wayne Cousins story where he could have been stopped before. That's the, that's the really critical bit here, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and, and in a way, like, this is the most important story we're probably going to discuss tonight, right? Because it's, it cannot be stressed enough, not just the importance of trust in policing for actually making policing work but also like this has been accelerated mm. by the two cases that you we've just mentioned but actually i think that the lack of trust in the policing has been going on for quite some time and i think it really does impact the ability for police to keep people safe and it frustrates me a lot that a lot of the conversation around policing centers on um you know funding and is this the right funding but i think there are really good police forces and really bad police forces that are really kind of abstract from the question of funding and we should really look at some of the things that you need to do to deliver the kind of integrity to the system that really matters. And this is, these are not two, it doesn't seem to me, isolated cases of poor behaviour, misconduct, mm. severe abuses of power, and more rigour around that is absolutely essential, whether that's about stop and search, whether that's about, um, you know, domestic violence, whether that's about, you know, cases such as these. And, and this is really an important thing that almost has you thinking, why wasn't this done sooner? But it's in the interest of good police officers, a huge number of police yeah. good police officers, that the bad ones are out. Yeah. And uh, Rowley's talked about scores and scores of those in the Met. He wants to get out, he's saying he, he can't. Any complaints about the current system, which often is sort of lawyer-led, is, is too soft, he says. But, you know, if there are accusations against a police officer, they should be dealt with in, an, in a normal way, like any, anybody else in a workplace. Mm. OK, well, the, uh, the connected stories, the, the idea of trust and visibly doing the right thing mm. in justice in the health service and in the police service, sort of running through the theme so far. To the eye, tax cuts. Here we go again. Uh, I feel like I hear this quite regularly. The Chancellor rules out any red meat for angry Tory MPs. Why are they still angry, Anita? <laughs> well, because we all know the tax burden is high, and it's high than it's been for a very long time. Um, and this is... Really, Second World War. You know, <laughs> Jeremy Hunt is going to want to, you know, roll the pitch and manage expectations coming into the autumn, particularly because, you know, it's highly likely because of the higher inflation world that we're in that we're going to end up with some form of a windfall of some description um, at the budget. So the Chancellor has some wriggle room for what he wants to do with that money. And and it's kind of quite clear that Jeremy Hunt does not want to um, raise ta um, cut taxes. And he talked earlier in the summer about he not countenancing tax cuts if they make the battle against inflation harder, because he knows inflation is the thing that ultimately mm. makes every single Briton in the country poorer. And that's the thing that's really biting, whether it's food inflation or energy inflation. And he does not want to allow that to remain for one second longer. So I think this is, once again, Jeremy Hunt's attempt to sort of, I mean, I don't think he's particularly brief this but like trying to hold that line that we're not going to you know expect tax cuts now in the hope that mm. with inflation down coming into the new year pre-election there might be an opportunity for him to reconsider that point he'll he'll come up with the tax bribes at the election won't he? he'll do it next year oh, not no, you this definitely year save it. And, you keep yeah. your powder dry for now yeah and i think the only people who really are shouting now are, are, is the tory right who battled his trust and that was not a disaster wasn't it if we, if we go back to that budget but remember then 
One of the, one of the, one of the uh, tax cuts she was playing was a 1p cut in income tax, which Labour actually backed mm -hmm. uh, at the yeah, time, and then were very absolutely. quiet about it. Um, and of course, they'll just back whatever he comes up with next time on income tax, even if uh, you know, it's going to be ridiculous uh, for the public finances. But if he's three, if he's th three economic pledges, they stop the boats. Oh, that's going well. Cut NHS waiting list. Oh, that's going well. Uh, he, he didn't promise tax cuts. He said grow the grow the economy. It's broadly flatlining. Uh, reduce debt. Well, it's about over 100 percent now, which I think the highest since 1961. And, uh, and what was the third one? But it wasn't... Debt, growth and inflation. Yeah, it was inflation, inflation, bring inflation, which is the, probably the one he's had most success on by crashing the economy. Well. OK. Um, very quick, I'm going to just uh, read out some of the headlines on uh, Prince Harry. Harry takes a swipe at royals over lack of support after Afghanistan, a fresh, landing a fresh blow to the royal family by claiming he had no support work. Uh, network and uh, the biggest struggle for me was that no one around me really helped me seeing it brought back all the memories of the death of his mother when he was 12 and then Jan Moyer in the mail every time I want to warm to Prince Harry out comes that huffy sense of victimhood you've got 10 seconds so uh... but, uh, look, look whether you're for or against them the Invictus games are, are a good thing mm. but I think welcome to the real grim world I think most people who served in the forces complain about the lack of support when they come out he's, he's no he's no different uh, he's, 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 hi he's highlighting a big feeling so I think he deserves some credit for that, rather than saying his victimhood on this occasion. My defence okay. is he was, it was. It doesn't look like a swipe at the royals particularly. Okay, we we will talk more about that later. Anita Boateng and Kevin McGuire, thank you both very much. Mm.